Good morning, Legacy Church. Let's stand and worship together. shout his praise. That's why we're here today, to worship him, to love him, because he loved us first. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for your love, your forgiveness. God, we thank you that in you we can walk a path of life that is meaningful. And God, that we have purpose, that each and every one of us in this room has a purpose. And we thank you for that. We love you. God, the things that you will do through us is nothing we can ever fathom. And we thank you now for all of it. In Jesus' name, amen.
Oh, your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to Legacy. I'm Pastor Tammy, and we are so glad that you chose to be with us today. If you are a newcomer, welcome. I encourage you to get connected by filling out a Connect card at your seat or at lcga.info. Just bring that Connect card to the lobby where we have a small gift for you. It's our way of saying thanks for worshiping with us. I invite you to give financially to the mission of Jesus through Legacy Church. You can do that also at lcga.info 
or you can drop your gift in the box in the lobby. Your generosity makes a difference here in our community and around the world, so thank you. Now let's take a minute to check out what's happening at Legacy. Good morning, my name is Kyle and I'm excited to share with you the wonderful week that 15 people from our Legacy family had while ministering at the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in Allen, South Dakota. Our Legacy team served as the hands and feet of Jesus through both work projects in the city of Allen and by ministering to 12 teens and 45 children from the village of Pass Creek Church. Their fun day outreach even attracted more than 100 people from the village. Isn't that incredible? Legacy, let's continue to offer our prayers for continued fruitful ministry for our friends there in South Dakota. I also want to remind all the teenagers, including the new sixth graders, to mark your calendars for our annual Splat Day, which will be on Sunday, August 7th, immediately following morning worship. Our teenagers will enjoy lunch and games, as well as a crazy, wet, and messy time. You are not going to want to miss it. If you are new to Legacy and you have teenagers, Splat Day would be a great way to have an absolute blast while making some new friends. And finally, we are excited for you to join us today for our Blessing of the Backpack Sunday. At the close of the worship service, we will have a special time of prayer and a fully stocked backpack for all students of all ages and also teachers. Then everyone is invited to stay for lunch. We hope you'll join us. Thanks so much for being with us today. <laughs> Let's continue to worship and to hear a message from God's word as we continue our series. Isn't God good? His word is good, too. Uh, there was a long, long time ago. I don't look like the age I actually am, I hope. A long, long time ago when I was in high school, I had a friend. He was the preacher's son. You know you have to watch out for preacher's kids, right? Yeah. The preacher's son. And, of course, all of us girls, we just had a crush on him. And he told us he was not saved. He told us that he didn't trust Jesus, and he didn't believe um, in Jesus, and he didn't want to give his heart to him. And so we were at youth camp, a very powerful experience for youth. These are, those are very formative times for our youth when they have camps. And I remember our leader that night in our tent. Yes, I said tent. Mm -hmm. This was a long time ago. In Alaska. Our leader that night shared with us from Psalms 30. And she said, though weeping tarries for the night, joy comes in the morning. And ever since then, that's been one of my favorite life verses. And the next day, uh, when we had our service at night, and we had our time of invitation or our, our response time, Mark Shea, that was his name, he accepted Jesus and became a Christian, a brother in Christ. And so that verse was so special to me. And as I've gone through my life a lot of years since then, that verse has been a verse that I fall back on. And you may be in a situation now where that's a verse that you can hold fast to. That weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning.
praise you when my faith is gone. Praise you because you hear the song I'm singing. I'm singing. Amen for that. We are super excited about our children's church, but before we dismiss you, we want our children to have a great children's service, so we're going to ask that all the backpacks get left here with all the adults, and that will make us have a really great service. So we invite all of our kiddos, fifth grade and under, to leave your backpacks here and head out to the lobby. Wow, it's great to hear all of those sounds. And uh, we're so excited that uh, it's Blessing of the Backpack Sunday. And so I did want to let you know that um, we're, we're so excited to have the children here with us and to be able to pray for them. And that will happen at the close of the worship service today. And if you're, if you're watching online or watching this later, we just want to encourage you to make a connection with us. Let us know. Send us a message that you're watching because we want to connect with you. And so I just want to have a moment this morning where we connect with God through prayer. And so if you would kind of just start focusing in your mind, have I connected with God today? Have you prayed yet today? Have you, other than maybe ask, thank God for your breakfast? A lot of you don't eat breakfast, so maybe you haven't had a time to even pray yet. And so I just want to encourage you just for a moment, we want to connect with God. It's a great opportunity on Sunday morning. We've had great worship and, and heard about some great things coming up in, our, in the life of our church. But I want you to focus for just a moment on connecting with God. I want to ask you just briefly, before I share the message today, what is really heavy on your mind today? What is really difficult for you right now? And I want you to know that God cares. And so we just want to have a prayer now and just lift up 
First, our praises and thanksgiving for who he is. This beautiful song we just sung reminds us, weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And in the journey, we will find God. If you have a special need that is really on your heart, this morning and you just like the group to pray would you just kind of slip up your hands right now and pay attention those in your row if you see someone nearby pay attention if their hands are up we do have a lot of heavy hearts this morning and joyful at the same time father we just come to you today and we ask you how can we do what you've asked us to do in your word how can we rejoice always how can we in everything give thanks how can we pray without ceasing? Just, God, how can we do that? It's just so difficult sometimes. When things are going really well and we're on the mountaintop and we're, we're happy and, and, and things are happening that kind of the way we plan, then it's easy. But God, when it isn't, it's so hard. So today, God, would you just visit us afresh and anew with the power of your Holy Spirit for those who are downtrodden, discouraged, for those who are disappointed with things in life, for those who are struggling with health and finances and in things, God, that are just kind of overwhelming. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's just situations that we're in and they're just hard. God, we just want to ask for your presence to be heavy upon us this morning. And would you let, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you let your folks know that are listening to this today that you are there for them, that you never leave them, you will never forsake them, and that your love is constant. So Lord, we pray as a group today for one another. We pray for the folks on our right, on our left, behind us and in front of us, for those who are watching online. We pray, God, that you would just transcend all of the barriers that we as humans tend to put up and move through with your spirit to minister to the hearts and souls of everyone here. Lord, we love you. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen. You know, one of the funniest uh, pictures I've ever seen were failed tattoos. You ever seen failed tattoos? I could have gotten a slide of this, but you can picture this really easily. A guy had had a um, uh, kind of a triumphal tattoo uh, printed on his, the side of his shoulder here, the side of his arm, and it was supposed to read, No Regrets. Have you seen this one? But it said no regerts. They actually just transposed the E and the R. And I wonder now, you know, if that guy had any regrets about getting a tattoo. You know, regrets are something that, that we all have. And in our summer series, Summer Vibes, we talk about, we've talked about several of the top 10 emotions that everyone feels. And guess what? Regret is one of them. Now, what I want to do this morning during these few moments that I have with you is to help you uh, maybe understand regret a little bit better and see how regret can be turned into triumph today. Regret is actually the number one negative emotion, according to psychologists and, and people who study these kind of things, behavioral folks. It's the second most powerful emotion, next, second only, to love. I was really super happy that regrets wasn't number one overall, because I really believe love is the key to everything, especially when you experience God's love, and through God's love, even up your game to love one another. But all of us experience regret. If you think right now, what's something you regret? What's something you regret either not doing or doing? There are two types of regrets, one of inaction, one of action. There's a couple biblical examples that I want to give you early on to, today as I share this message with you. In Matthew 26, we find the, the um, trial of Jesus unfolding after he was arrested and, and right before his crucifixion. And I'm going to read a couple verses. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. Peter was his number one guy. I mean, he was his fan. His, he, Peter said, I'll go anywhere with you, even if I have to die with you. I'll die with you. I'll go anywhere with you, Jesus. Now, just a few hours after that, here Peter is in the courtyard, and a servant girl came over and said to him, hey, you were with Jesus of the, Gal the Galilean, and Peter denied it. So he went from big-time followership to denying Jesus. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. Then later out by the gate, another service servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around, this guy was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again, Peter denied it. And this time he not only denied it, he accompanied it with some swear words, with an oath. 
He said, I don't even know him. Third time, later, some of the bystanders came over to Peter and said, hey, you must be one of them. We can tell by your accent. You talk like he does. Peter swore and he said, a curse come down on me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. Now, can you, can you kind of picture that maybe there's some regret that might happen later with Peter? And after that third denial, the, the rooster crowed. Now, here's the verse I want to show with, share with you. Matthew 26, 75. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times, or you will deny three times that you even know me. And he went away, Peter did, weeping bitterly. A sign of regret. A sign that he did not stand up for Christ. A, a regret of inaction. Now, just right around that time as well, there's another disciple struggling big time. Early the next morning, the leading priests and the elders of the people, this is found in Matthew 27, met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. They bound him, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the governor. And so we pick up the story here. When Judas, the one who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. Now, remorse is one of the deepest forms of regret. So he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priests and elders, and he said, I've sinned. I betrayed an innocent man. What do we care, they retorted. That's your problem. Then, Jesus, or then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out and hanged himself. That's a pretty deep form of regret, wouldn't you say? Regret to the point of not even wanting to live. Now, Bonnie Ware, who is a palliative caregiver from Australia, wrote a book, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And I plucked five of those out and kind of made a synopsis of them, and I want to share them with you. Those who are dying, they knew they were dying, and, and they were experiencing uh, the goodness of palliative care to take care of them, keep them comfortable as they died. Five regrets of the dying surfaced. One of them was, I wish I'd had the courage to be true to myself, to my own calling, to who I was, rather than live trying to fulfill the expectations of others. Let that sink in for a moment. One of the second most frequently mentioned by those who were dying was, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I wish that I'd taken more time to spend with other people, and doing some of the things that would have brought me enjoyment. The third one was, I wish I'd have stayed in touch with my friends. I let so many relationships go, I didn't, I made what I was all about and what I was doing and my pursuits number one, and I lost touch with people. The fourth one was, I wish I had let myself be happier. I was always uptight about something, people would say. I always had something that was robbing me of happiness. And, and she wrote this, that happiness can be found in the journey, not just the destination. Let me just pause here and give you a little personal insight into me. I'm always looking for something that I'm going to do in the future. Now, I, I appear like I'm happy, but I, I really am looking forward to something else a lot. And God spoke to me a few years ago and said, why? Why can't you just be happy with what's going on today? And man, that's a constant battle for me. I'm always looking forward to uh, some big happening or something in the future. And that's a problem, and I regret that. And the last one she mentions the, of the five, I wish that um, uh, I, let's see, I had the courage to express my feelings. You know, do you, do you want to take the risk of letting how people know how you feel? You know, so we just, we mask things, and, and sometimes we, we appear the way we think other people want us to appear. So these were the five regrets. Well, the award-winning writer in Psychology Today, Bruce Grierson, he said this, life's too short to waste one second of it on regrets. Those who are 100 years old, he said, tell us this when we ask them for a nugget of wisdom. They say, proceed boldly. Don't leave yourself open to saying on your deathbed, I wish I so today I want to unfold just a little bit about how I, I think we can look at regret and how we can proceed forward and use regret 
in a positive way. Now, this is incredible to me that we start expressing regrets at age two. Let that sink in for a moment. We begin to express regrets at age two. As soon as we're able to articulate the concept of if only, and thereafter we're continually rewriting history in our heads. You know, it's a hold that Satan can use on us to keep us in the past and to keep us enslaved to what we either didn't do or should have done. So I want to talk to you about how to harvest good things from regret. First of all, I want to tell you this, and this is the message of the church. Restoring identity, the restoration of identity, can come through regret. Now you might say, well, what do you mean, Pastor Nate? Well, here's what I mean by that. If we know that we are God's child, there are things that come with that assurance, such as, forgiveness of sins, such as the promise of eternal life, that if we were to die at any given point in, in our personal history, we would go to be with the Lord for eternity. So if we, if we can let regrets lead us to who we are, then we can, be, we can be in control of that. We can have God's help with that. So I went to the well, Pastor Wellman, and I, I looked at some of his writings, and one of the things that he said was, there, there are, some, there are some, some things as we restore our identity by looking at regret that will help if we really look at them in depth. And I won't take time to go in depth too much, but let me tell you this. Instead of having regret or having fostering and harvesting that regret as being negative, spend more time with your family. Spend more time with those whom you love, whom you care about. Carve out your, of your own agenda the ability to give to those you love. More time with family. Pastor Wellman said, hey, I've heard a few older people who aren't even on their deathbed say that they wish they would have spent more time with their family and more time serving God. That's the number two. More time serving God. Now, if you look at your quotient of serving God today, have you loved others? Have you served God? Have you served the church? Have you given of your time, talent, and resources? Some of us will say, well, you know what? I'll do that later. When I got things taken care of, I'll serve God more. I'll volunteer. I'll help. Now, I'll look across this congregation, and so many of you have volunteered and lived your life to serve. And I know that, that when you serve, you have no regrets. We just had 15, uh, 13 or 14 folks from, from South Dakota come back. And I, I was here when they got back last Sunday. They were exhausted. But out of the lips and on their faces were expressions of no regrets. None of them were sad that they went to serve, to love, and to proclaim the, the, the goodness of God. None of them. And so think about it today. One of the ways that we can use our identity as a child of God is to serve the church more. Another thing Pastor Wellman mentioned was more expressions of love. You know how to do that? You just do it. You just love. Show love. Even if it's not natural, show love. Let people know you care about them. Another one that he mentioned was people wish they would have done more evangelism. You know, I think we may regret at some point in time as we enter into eternity, I think we may regret that we didn't take more people with us to heaven. I think that's one of our goals. I believe that's at the core of who we are as a church, that we are to fulfill the Great Commission. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Paul asked, how will they call on him, meaning people in general, whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of, of, of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone telling them? You see, it's your news to tell. Don't regret the fact at the end of your life that you had the solution to people's eternity de eternal destiny in your mouth. 
and you never let it out. Share Christ. Share love with others. So how do we kind of process this? How do we do this? How can we, how can we get free so we can do these things that I've just shared? Well, again, I went to another writer, Dawn Wilson at Crosswalk, and she gave us some insight on how, as Christ followers, we can use regret to prompt us into action. First, we need to understand that not all regret is wrong. Now, look at Peter. He regretted what he had done, and it caused him later, when he got the power of the Holy Spirit in him, it caused him later to be the greatest evangelist of that period. He went out and preached, and he gave his life for the sake of the gospel. No turning back. So he turned those regrets into action. Judas, on the other hand, reacted the other way. Could Judas have been forgiven? Could Judas have become powerful for God, a powerful instrument of Christ? Of course he could have, but he chose to let the regrets destroy him. Realize this, that your regrets that you feel don't have to be negative. They can drive us to do the right thing. Now, let me just tell you this, that regret can overpower us, but there are antidotes to its power, and I want to give you some here. There's, there's four R's. If you can remember those, if you're writing them down, jot them down in your phone, in your notes, or whatever. First of all, if you are a child of God, and that's what our prayer is, if you're here today or you're listening online and you have not found Christ as your personal Savior, to ask him for forgiveness, ask him to come into your lives, will be a fantastic thing. And I can tell you beyond the shadow of a doubt, it will bring you peace like you've never had before. So rest, number one, is rest in the forgiveness of God. If you've been forgiven by Jesus Christ of your sins, rest in that. You have eternal life. You have freedom from your sin. Rest in God's forgiveness. You know, some people can't forgive themselves for what they've done. When you can't forgive yourselves and, and you harbor that and you, you keep that inside, you know what you're doing? You're saying that God's blood or Christ's blood that he shed on the cross isn't enough. It is. It was and continues to be and always will be enough. You don't have to relive it. Now, you can't forget things. You're human. But you can rest in the fact that you are forgiven. That's how you conquer regrets. Yes, I regret the things I've done, the sins that I've committed. But rest in his forgiveness and realize that if the devil can say, if you feel guilty, you are, and you need to continue to feel that way, that's his job. That's his goal to keep you under the power of past sin. You don't have to be there. You can rest in God's forgiveness. Second one, so rest. Second one is resist the urge to beat yourself up. I continually beat myself up for being a knucklehead. You know, those of you who know me well know that I sometimes enter the room mouth first. I sometimes talk before I, I think. And I have got a problem with that. And sometimes I have deep regret about that. And it comes back to really hurt me and harm me. And so then, for the next period of time, sometimes it's a few hours, sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's years, I have a tendency to beat myself up. Paul, he could have beat himself up for persecuting Christians. He was responsible before he became a powerful force and write 30% of the New Testament. He was an enemy of Christianity. He, he made sure that Christians got killed, and I'm sure he had regret about that, but he turned that regret into power for God. He could have stayed beaten up, and he could have just continually pushed himself down, but he recognized, he rested in Christ's forgiveness, and he recognized his position. For, thirdly, reset. So rest, resist the urge to beat yourself up, reset your mind with the truth. The enemy wants to tell you one thing, you need to believe what the Bible says about you. Reset your mind with the truth. And then fourthly, redeem your regrets. Write the wrongs if you can. Go back and, and apologize. Write the wrongs if you can. Otherwise, let God handle it. William Borden, 
Some of you have heard of Borden Foods, Borden Dairy. For those of you who are older, you remember Elsie, the cow. I have to talk about the cow, right? Being an old farm boy. William Borden in 1903, a bright young man, graduated from high school, a millionaire. Why? He was the heir to the Borden fortune. Following graduation, William took a trip around the world. He could afford it, so he did it. 1903, imagine. Everywhere, though, he went, he was touched by the needs of people. He eventually wrote his parents to announce that he was going to give up his fortune. I don't want to be an heir. I don't want the fortune. Write me out of the will because I want to devote my life till I die to telling other people about Christ. In his Bible, he wrote and dated that. Two words. No reserves. I don't need any reserve. I don't need the security blanket of that inheritance. If I change my mind, if I don't want to do it anymore, I can come back and be covered and taken care of financially. He just said, no, just, just forget me as far as it, 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 it goes, uh, before, as it regards uh, the fortune, and I'm going to give my life to sharing Christ around the world. Two years later, he enrolled in Yale in 1905. He quickly became the spiritual leader of the entire campus. Now listen to this. At his, nearing his graduation, he had ministered to over 1,000 of the 1,300 then Yale students through Bible study. They were involved in Bible study. 1,000 out of 1,300 Yale students. You think that's making a difference? Wow. And he led off-campus ministries as well. Now, upon graduating, he wanted to fulfill his intention to be a missionary, so he enrolled in seminary. When he got his degree from seminary, he bought a one-way trip ticket to Egypt, where he could learn Arabic so he could minister and share the gospel with Muslims there. Leaving his fortune behind, he set sail. On the way, he wrote in his Bible two more words, no retreats. One-way ticket, I'm going, I don't have reserves, I don't have money, I'm just going to do what God has called me to do. He arrived in Egypt full of anticipation, immersed himself in the tasks at hand, but within a few days of his arrival, he became weak and was soon diagnosed with spinal meningitis. A short time later, William Borden died at the age of 25. Now, while we can't understand, our logic can't understand his death, an ocean away, hundreds were impacted because of his joyful, willing sacrifice. No reserves, no retreats. That's the way he wanted it. He wanted to make an impact with his life for the gospel of Christ. During the fleeting days of his life, he wrote two more words in his Bible in shaky handwriting already affected by the condition that would kill him very quickly, he had written the words, no regrets. My friends, a life lived for Jesus, a life lived in surrender to God, will bring you to the point of no regrets. Will you let go and let God have control of your life? Listen to the Holy Spirit and let him direct you? It is our prayer that you Will you pray with me? Father, today, we know that when Jesus prayed in the garden and he said, Father, if it be thy will, help me get out of what I'm about to endure. And you said, no, I can't do that. This is the plan. Son, this is what you're going to have to do to, to, to forgive the sins of, of mankind through the shedding of your blood. And Jesus went through all the way to the end, and I am positive that he had no regrets. I am positive today, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that if we will allow God to have reign of our life, if we'll put our faith and our trust in him, that we'll have no regrets. So help us today. Look forward. Help us to enjoy the journey of walking with you do the important things. 
that we've talked about this morning. Set our eyes on Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Today, as we get ready for communion, we'll ask you to exit to the left and return back to the right. But as you take your communion and spend some time, maybe you want to go back to your chair and before you open the, the packaging, to take the elements to remember Jesus' has sacrifice for you. Maybe what you want to do is just spend a few moments. Just a few moments and ask God to search you. Examine your heart. Is there something in there that's sinful? The Bible tells us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he'll do that for you today. So I encourage you, before you take communion, before you receive those elements, which you can do when you return to your seat. You can pause anywhere around the front here if you want to stand or kneel at the steps. That you take time to examine yourself. Life with Jesus is the best. Have no regrets. Would you stand together as we move toward communion? Begin to process, process. Will you help us examine our hearts as we honor you through your blood and through your body, represented by these symbols in Christ's name. Amen. God, we thank you so much for this time, this time of remembering what you've done for us. God, you're so good, and we just pray to have a life lived with you with no regrets. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to stand and worship with us.
Today is the day you have made. be seated. Amen. Hello. Okay, so all the kids are joining their families, and if they want to grab a hold of their backpacks, I'm going to pass out a few instructions here so everybody knows what we're going to do. In a little bit, I'm going to invite fifth graders and younger who are starting classes. I'm going to invite you to come join me here on stage and with your backpacks in your hands, okay? And we'll spread out. Let's fill this stage here. And then I'm going to invite middle and high school students who start school um, soon here, private school, public school, home school, Kids, students, middle school and high school, if you would stand right in front. And then I want to invite, if you are starting college in the near future here, you're starting to go to classes, and or if you are a teacher or any school employee, homeschool teacher, private school teacher, cheerleader, instructor for a school, whatever role you might have in the life of a school, I'm going to ask that you would... Um, be in the aisles here, on the side aisles. And then as a church, we are going to pray. And I love how we pray for one another. We're just going to put our hands reached out and just pray a prayer blessing. What is a blessing? A blessing is when we say we're going to pray a prayer of blessing over these backpacks. We're, what is a blessing? It's when we're asking for God um, to show his favor, to show his love, to show his care, um, to, show, to show up in our life. And we're all in one accord that we certainly need that. Amen? Amen. So fifth graders and younger, would you walk up here and join me here on stage? Coming up the steps. And while they're joining me, Yeah, even if you don't have your backpack. Yep. Okay, if you are taller than me or almost as tall as me, you want to take two steps back and invite kids who are a little shorter than you to step in front. There we go, to make room for more kiddos. Okay. For the little people, we want to make sure that we have plenty of space here. Littles, littles, yeah. Isn't this just the best? Okay. Okay, while I have these good-looking kids up here, I want to give you a couple of announcements. First of all, church, I want to thank you for all these donations of all these supplies. It was like a party here when Amazon truck would come <laughs> and um, bring all these supplies. Thank you so much. And the Vision Forward team, Legacy Vision Forward team chaired by Tammy McIntyre, um, has planned this all out. And I just want to thank you for the vision and carrying it out. Amen. Okay, middle school and high school students, would you join us right here in front of the tables? 
if you have your backpack, bring it with you. Stand right in front of the tables. And look at all these people who love you. Okay? And if you are starting college and or a teacher serving at a school or homeschool parent, would you fill the aisles there on both sides? This is a lot of people. A lot of people. Yeah. And I think God wants you to know that y'all matter. Y'all matter to him. And he's ready to put blessing on all of us this morning. Parents, those of you who have kids who are standing up here, would you stand? Parents. Yeah. We know this is a big deal. <laughs> okay. Would you join me in prayer? Boys and girls, we're going to pray now. Lord Jesus, as these students open their backpacks of supplies each morning, would you remind them how much you love them, that you provide for them, and that you have an incredible plan for them. Every time they open their backpack, may they enjoy the blessings of your goodness. And in turn, God, we pray these students would demonstrate kindness, they would lead the way in showing respect, that they would live as peacemakers. And God, just as iron sharpens iron, may they choose friends wisely, asking you to lead them and guide them in their relationships. God, help them to be slow to anger and quick to listen. You've promised to give wisdom when we ask, so God, I pray that you would prod them to speak up when their words can really make a difference. Above all, God, for every student standing, may they always consider you, Lord, as their best friend. Lord, we pray you will make them outstanding leaders and imitators of your character. We pray that as students deal with tests, often not just with schoolwork or homework, but in their walk with you, Jesus. Help them to be bold as lions, that their faith would not be shaken by those who may be questioned or doubted. Give them knowledge of your word. Bless them, Lord, with your constant care and guidance. Help our students to walk humbly and to honor you every day to remain true to their calling. May they be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks them for the hope or the confidence that they have in you. Help them to let their light shine and shine brightly at school and wherever they go so that others who observe their attitudes and their actions will know that they are the real thing. Bless and protect our children's hearts and bodies and minds. By the power of the Holy Spirit who helps us to recall your word, may we have truth on the tips of our tongues to remind our kids what you say about them. May they always know that you love them and that they are yours. Stir their hearts to hear your call in their lives early so that their steps would follow fast after you for all of their days. God, now we're going to pray for our teachers for an abundance of your wisdom. God, we pray that you would prepare their hearts to welcome and love our loved ones, may we make sh and that they would make sure to show them love and respect in return. God, bless them with grace as they help students who aren't thriving. Courage to say what needs to be said, tools and knowledge on how and when to speak love, and to bless them with strength when they feel weak and tired. When they feel unseen, remind them that no moment goes unnoticed. What they are doing every day, all day long, they're shaping the future in all kinds of incredibly important ways. We are overwhelmed, God, with gratitude for the gift of learning that they share with our children. Bless them, every one of them, Lord, and may they see even just a glimpse of how their faithfulness in teaching will forever impact generations to come. So in Jesus' name, we pray for a blessing over these children, young and old, your children, we pray for a blessing over these backpacks that they would be filled with lots of love and goodies that they would use all year round, Jesus. And we love you and we pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So if you'd stay right where you are, parents, you can be seated. Um, just a couple things. So 
when um, the service is closing, there's three tables up here. And if you are fifth graders or younger, you're going to come to this table. So the helpers, if you want to come man these tables, you're going to come to this table, fifth graders and younger, to get your backpack. And if you're middle or high school, you've got a backpack here, specially designed for middle and high school. And if you're a college student and or a teacher over here, you're going to get your supplies. This seems a little crazy, um, and it is. We don't do this every Sunday, right? <laughs> but um, ay, it's so cool. It's so awesome. After church, after we leave here, um, if you filled out a Connect card, if this is your first Sunday here, welcome. We are so glad to worship with you. There will be someone at the Welcome Center there in the lobby. Um, give them your Connect card, and we have a gift for you. And then if you all, as you exit here, you'll go out these doors, and there's lunch. There's lunch and um, that's provided for you by our wonderful Maricela, who cooks just the best Mexican food. So we're super excited for that. And boys and girls, everybody who gets a backpack, um, you can get a little ticket that um, um, the, the workers will give to you. And when you, um, during lunchtime, we're going to draw some of those tickets for extra prizes. Okay? Honestly, we had so many supplies donated that we want to we wanna bless everybody with them. So um, let's pray, shall we? God, thank you for this day. Thank you for kids. Thank you that you set the example in how we are to love one another and be like a child in our faith, always curious, always creative, always looking for you. God, I pray a blessing over each person in this room, and I pray, Father, for our fellowship and our conversation to be pleasing over the table as we, as we share food together. You're a good God. We love you so much, and we pray all this thing in Jesus' name. Everybody said...